So I got my bachelor's degree in chemistry last year and I wrote my bachelor thesis in the field of synthetic organic chemistry. And in this video, I want to give you some insights about what research in organic chemistry looks like and how it can contribute to the fight against cancer or other diseases. And to introduce you into this topic, we should start with the greatest synthetic chemist of all time, which is nature itself, because many really complicated compounds, which might be suitable for medical application, are found in nature and are synthesized with ease by organisms of all kind. And we as an organic chemist, we try to mimic some of those synthetic strategies or find our own synthetic strategies. But in most cases, we are really not better than nature. And therefore we obtain some drugs by the use of biotechnological methods, such as insulin, which is obtained by bacteria, which synthesizes insulin for us. But we cannot always do that. And this is when organic chemists come into play. This is especially required when we found a molecule in nature, but we are not able to isolate huge amounts of it. So for example, in 2019, a group of researchers found an interesting compound which is called campuridine A, which is the molecule of my bachelor thesis. This is the structure of it. And it was found inside an ant, but not only inside an ant, but in the gut bacteria of an ant. So you can imagine that you will have to kill a lot of ants to obtain only small amounts of this compound. And this is where we come into play as synthetic chemists, because then we make it as a challenge to synthesize this compound. And in this way, we can obtain larger amounts of it by just synthesizing this compound in our lab instead of trying to harvest a lot of ants. But what's so interesting about campuridine A? Well, when this team isolated it, they tested it for biological activities. And indeed, they found that campuridine A is able to suppress the migration and the cell invasion of metastatic breast cancer cells, meaning that it could be a molecule which could be used for the treatment of breast cancer. But one has to mention, it is not like this compound is the absolute best molecule which was found for this purpose. But you have to think of it like this. We found this biological activity for campuridine A and we can try to enhance this activity by changing its structure a little bit, maybe putting some functional groups there and getting rid of some functional groups here. And this could be more like a start of a drug series or the start of further research regarding the treatment of cancer by campuridine A. But if you only have small amounts of it, then we cannot do a lot of testing. So it is now our challenge to find a way to synthesize this campylidine A compound from scratch, basically. And that's what's called total synthesis. We try to synthesize a more or less complicated compound by using really easily available chemicals, doing our chemical magic by letting those chemicals react with each other and then slowly but surely building the framework which then leads to our desired target compound. Well, now the chemists are excited because they found this uh, new target molecule they can try to synthesize. But you might ask yourself, how do we know which kind of reactions we have to perform and which compounds we have to use to obtain campuridine A? And this is done by something which is my favorite topic in organic chemistry or in chemistry in general. And we do this by analyzing this compound retrosynthetically, which basically means that we look at our compound and then we think of strategic ways we can disassemble this compound so that we disassemble it to easy fragments, which we then disassemble even further. And in the end, we will get really small molecules and then we just have to think backwards. So we disassemble it and then we reassemble it again in the lab. And if you're not very familiar with chemical structures, you can think of this compound like a set of Lego blocks. So in each corner of this compound, there sits a carbon atom with hydrogens attached to it, but that's not so important right now. And every line you see there is a chemical bond. You can think of the bond like what's holding Lego pieces together to form, for example, a house of Legos. We then think about how we can detach these bonds so that we then get either fragments or when we stick to this analogy, how we can detach the Lego block so that we can in the end have a few blocks of Legos, which we don't just have to put back together. So retosynthesis is something theoretical. We disassemble it theoretically, and then in the lab, we try to recreate what we thought of might be a synthetic strategy. 
Well, so far so good, but as you can imagine, the bigger the molecule gets, the more ways are there to synthesize it. So the strategy I'm going to show you is just one of the many possible strategies and nobody can promise you that your strategy will really work in the end. So of course we do our sampling of this molecule by logical thinking and by our chemical knowledge, which tells us what's possible and what's not possible. But in the lab, you will find out that most of the things that you are really sure of are possible are actually not feasible at all. So you really have to be resilient towards failure because oftentimes in a lab, you will fail. And I'm going to show you where I failed. And in, in most cases, it's not a personal failure, but it's more like, yeah, um, <laughs> nature tells us, no, that's not going to work. And I will not go too much into detail about what exactly we thought about in the synthetic strategy or the virtual synthetic plan. But I want to show you this molecule, which is just a compound that we will obtain on our way to Comparidine A. And it has a special feature because this six-membered ring is called a cyclohexene ring with a nitrogen in it. So it is actually called a tetrahydropyridine ring. It's easier for now to think of it like an cyclohexene ring. And when you see such a structure in organic chemistry, you immediately think about the diels alder reaction, which is just a really famous reaction to obtain these kind of cyclohexene frameworks. Usually cyclohexenes only contain carbon. But as I said, in our case, there is a nitrogen atom in it. So we have to perform this reaction with a little twist. There are ways where we can do this diels alder reaction but also with different atoms, with a nitrogen atom, for example, in one of the starting materials of this reaction, where we can not obtain a cyclohexene, but this tetrahydropyridine ring. And this special kind of reaction where we use a diels alder reaction, but with nitrogens in our starting material, this is called an imino diels alder reaction, because we use an imine as one of the starting materials, which is this reagent that contains the nitrogen atom. So it would be really, really nice if we get this amino diels alder reaction to work, because then we would have a really elegant way. Um, you just have to believe me now that this would be a really good solution for this synthetic problem, because in this way we can easily synthesize the framework that we need. And also we would have to write stereochemistry in our molecule, which is just meaning that if one of those groups that are shown here look up or down, that's really important and the amino diels alder reaction would give us the correct stereochemistry for our compound. On the other hand, amino diels alder reactions are a bit tricky. They are not so reliable and there are ways to perform these kind of reactions. There are papers which show that these reactions are possible, but we don't really know yet if this is also possible in the way we would have to use it. And the only way to find out is by testing this reaction. But in order to do testing of the amino diels alder reaction, we need our compounds that will lead to our desired molecules by an amino diels alder reaction, meaning we have to find a way to synthesize the starting material for this reaction. And this is not so tricky. This is just a lot of uh, hard synthetic work, <laughs> so to say. And so my first job was to find a way to synthesize this compound. And the synthesis of the starting material of the tricky reaction was also tricky <laughs> because, because of this system here, which is called an allylic system. And the problem is that these compounds with allylic systems, which have what we call a leaving group in the allylic positions, are not that stable because the leaving group tends to dissociate from our framework because dissociation is made possible by this allylic system because the resulting cation is really stabilized. And this was a problem because I could not use any acids for my reactions towards this starting material uh, for the amino diels alder reactions because every acid will catalyze the dissociation of our compound. And acids are really, really important for organic chemistry. And also when we do the reactions, we want to purify our products and then we use something called silica gel. And silica gel is also a bit acidic. And it turned out that we could not just use silica gel to purify our compounds because the acidity of it will be sufficient for my molecule to dissociate. And then all of the work I put into synthesizing this molecule was for nothing because then after the treatment with silica gel or with any other acids, it would have decomposed. 
So I had to find workarounds, um, which I did. But if you are really interested in what exactly I did, um, you can find a link in the description where you can read the full bachelor thesis on your own. And so long story short, I was kind of able to obtain the starting material for the tricky Imino Dilsada reaction, but I could not purify the starting material, which just means that there was some other stuff in my compound that I didn't know exactly what it was. And I had no way of purifying it because this compound was so unstable that every attempt to purify it would lead to the decomposition of my molecule. So I had no other chance than to test the amino other reaction with my crude compound, which just basically means that it was dirty. And um, this is always suboptimal for chemical reactions because when the reaction fails, then we don't really know if it's because the reaction is just not possible with this molecule or if it's just because some of our impurities inhibits the reaction. Okay, so then I tested the amino acid reactions with my unpure starting material, which I synthesized. And testing basically means that we try several reaction conditions. We try performing the reaction at room temperature, then we try to perform it at really high temperatures, and then we try to add a catalyst or we try to add a dehydrating reagent because for this reaction it was really helpful when we remove water from the system because the starting material had to undergo a reaction before the amino acid reaction, which is the imine formation. And this reaction yields water as a product. And when we isolate water from this reaction, then we shift the equilibrium on the sides of the product. And it will just be better for the reaction when we remove the uh, resulting water. And I don't want to talk around it too much. It did not work. So um, every attempt of performing this amino acid reaction led to the decomposition of my starting material which was really sad, but during my bachelor thesis, it was kind of expected because my compound was just, it was just way too unstable. So as I said, this allylic system really tends to decompose already under really mild chemical conditions. So, so for example, it will actually be really good for this reaction if we could use an acid because this is a catalyst for this reaction and this will then speed up the whole process. But using acid just crushes our starting material and then it was all for nothing. Also, uh, higher reaction temperatures are often required for those amino acid other reactions, but those also lead to the composition of my starting material. And yes, this is not the end of the journey, but this was the end of my bachelor thesis because of course you have limited time. So basically what the results of my bachelor thesis tell us is that this strategy is not feasible. Maybe not because of the amino acid reaction itself, which is not possible, but more because the starting material which is required for this reaction is just too unstable and we cannot do any chemistry with it without decomposing our molecule. So this is kind of sad. So you could think it was all for nothing, but of course it was not all for nothing because we have to try out, right? So without trying our ideas, we will never know whether it's possible or not. Of course, you really think it through at the beginning if it's worth a shot or not, because you put a lot of time and money into such an idea. But in this case, it was worth a shot. In the end, it was not possible, but that's fine. That's research. And... Yes, I'm just really glad that I got to the point where I could actually test this reaction in my bachelor thesis because the synthetic steps before that were also really time consuming. And in the end, we just have to accept that this reaction is not possible and that we need to find another way of synthesizing Camperidine A. And so if you want to read my full bachelor thesis, because it is way more than I talked about it in this video, there's also a part in the bachelor thesis where you just write about the state of the art of the modern research about your topic. There I wrote some chapters and also um, you can find some other reactions I did there and the whole issues with the protecting groups that I had to face. I will put you the link in the video description. You can then read it for yourself. And if you have any questions regarding organic chemistry or my research, then just leave a comment down below. And I would really appreciate your support for this channel if you leave a like and a subscription. And I will see you in the next video. Bye bye.